Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. I'm in studio today with a good friend, Mark Luby. We're going to have a great podcast to kick off the 2024 year. Wow. How fun is that? The year is underway. It is fun. And Jay's heart's been underway for two months. <laughs> but that's uh, only a good church history joke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I actually get it. Well, the church calendar starts in December 1st. Okay, there we go. There Goal we go. setting is December 1st, my friends. You learn something new every year. And we are now just past Epiphany in the church calendar into common times up until Lent. For those who are nerdy enough to want to know that. <laughs> and Jay, share with us, what is Epiphany? Epiphany is the story of the Magi arrival at Christ in the Gospels. Yeah. So, so it goes with the joke that you should put the uh, Magi really far off from your manger narrative. Y- yes, you narrative. should. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, we could go into that. But yes. Another time. Yes. We're so, so glad you're listening today on the podcast. You want to go to calvarybible.com, click your campus, let us know that you're here and a part of the community. You can always go to the mobile bulletin check in give a prayer request also go to your mobile bulletin or the events page at calvarybible.com make sure you connect here in 2024 at calvary it is such a great church to jump into and just as you might need us we need you to be a part of here at calvary bible church so go to calvarybible.com today and the comps team will be super excited that i said that because they're always excited when you put people back to the website it's the most clear front page of calvary all right mark we're in the new year Uh you just got back this last week you were actually in florida i was in florida how cool is it that calvary supports our pastors and sends them to seminary and there you were a seminary. What, what seminary are you going to right now? So I'm going to Reformed Theological Seminary, yeah, which is based out of Orlando. There's a number of campuses, but the campus I'm at is in Orlando. Yeah. And there's a program that's a hybrid program. So you do part of it online, part of it on campus. And I was blessed to go for a week and be there in person. So that was fun. What class did you take last week? So I actually took pastoral ministry. Okay. And it was a great class. That was really good. You you had some good books from that class. Yeah, there was some amazing books. What book would you recommend from that class for someone nerdy to read? Okay, well, it depends on how nerdy. Uh, there was a Augustine book. Mm-hmm. My friend Patrick will be right, proud that I pronounced that right because yeah. he's a huge Augustine fan. But yeah. there's an Augustine book on instructing new believers, essentially. I don't remember the exact title, but something like that. It was really good. But there was also a book that was a modern book. Uh, called Digital Liturgies by Samuel James. Yeah, you talked about this over and over again. Oh, it was good. I think it's a 2023 release, but it is worth reading. Wow, Dig- um, Digital Liturgies. Digital Liturgies. And basically what it's talking about is how our online world shapes the way that we think and interact. And it's not not merely that it shapes the information that we give, but even how it shapes our thinking and our ways of uh living in the world and just being aware of that. It's not like internet, it's all evil, but also knowing that it's, it's not all neutral. It does change how we think. Right. It's, it's, it's functional and how it forms a human being. Yeah. Yeah. And and it talks about different practices online of ways that the web shapes us, whether that be through anger, outrage, um, through looking for novel things to capture your attention. And it was just, it was really really helpful and challenging personally for me and my technology habits. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. It makes me, it makes me question how much I really want YouTube algorithms <laughs> to shape me as a human being. Right. And how much do I just go to YouTube and say, give me something to watch, you know? Right. Um, it's, it's you gotta be careful. So yeah. it, it challenged me. Digital liturgies by Samuel James. James. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. Looking forward to actually opening that book up in 2024. Yeah. It's on my list. So, yeah. Well, it's a new year, and we're in a new study. Coming out of Revelation, we decided to take a pause from a major book study for just a season to talk about relationships. Um, We all have relationships. If you're a human being, 
you're in relationships. Yes. And so we want to go to God's word for his instruction on how to live in relationships. And there's no better book than the book of Colossians when it comes to sort of relational living. And Colossians is a really interesting book. And it's an epistle, which means it is a book that Paul had wrote a letter to a church. Uh, how many epistles are there, Mark? Oh, man. I think 15, 17. I've, uh, I'm going to kill myself. For <laughs> not, yeah, come on, Jake. Come on. The, I forget. There's an, I, I don't know so, if I, can, I can't tell you the number off the top of my head. Right. There's many epistles. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So um, Paul writes to the church in Colossae. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. The city of Colossae. A. Um, it's a, it's a very interesting Asia minor city, uh, that he had frequented in his missionary travels. And he writes to them about sort of what is going on in their culture and time. Mm -hmm. You summed it up well, just a minute ago and asked you sort of what's the background of the book of Colossians? What were the people like trying to do or think about yeah. Um, in that church. Well, one of the main ideas in Colossians is that Christ is supreme over all. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the challenges it seems like that was going on in Colossians is people were looking for insight, wisdom, revelation, understanding. And you see this kind of at the end of Colossians 2, um, where you say, where Paul talks about in certain things, he says, Verse, let's go, let's start in verse 16. Colossians 2, 16. Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on and he says, you know, he, he talks about different things, but one of the challenges it seems like they were facing was people are looking for wisdom and insight and mm -hmm. asceticism is mentioned here. And so how do you, how do you get insight? Well, maybe it's through severity to your body. Maybe it's through severe discipline of your body. Maybe it's through, angelic visions um, and there's all these different ways that you can think about how am I going to really grow mature and tap into the beauty of the divine right and Paul is trying to say before you start trying all these things or, or rather than trying all these things rather than going to all these places right. you need to know what you have in Christ and Christ is the one in whom all the mysteries of God are hidden and you are in him. You are alive in him. And so he's really calling them not to go to their own religious practices, not to go to their own principles, not to go to their own ways or old ways that they were once enslaved to, but rather say, look, if you want to truly live life, you need Christ and you can't go anywhere else other than in Jesus who is Lord over all. Right. And that's really the central message and theme of all these sermons in this series called Flourish. Yeah. Is... We want to flourish. God wants us to flourish. He has been about the flourishing of people yeah. from the beginning. And the only way that happens is centralizing your heart, your mind, your attitude, every part of your being on Christ. Mm. And so often I think we're like the people of the Colossian church who want the things of God, like, some habits, some tricks, yeah. some newness, novelty, and forget that Christ is actually the reason why we will flourish. Yeah. What What are some ways, like help help contextualize this for yeah. us? Like maybe some people are going on in worship of angels, but maybe unknowingly, but what, what, uh, like what are ways that people actually like today in our culture, you often see that people are looking for this divine insight, divine wisdom, and Christ is there his word is there like what, what what do people go to instead yeah i think you know they go to some self-help books yeah like looking to better themselves without actually approaching christ to help them better themselves yeah does that make sense yeah they they go to new year's resolutions and goal setting which aren't necessarily bad yeah you know if your doctor says you need 
to get healthy, a goal is a great place to start. Yeah. However, to to make yourself happy or to help yourself um, feel happy or good or productive about yourself, you will set those goals. Yeah. Instead of letting Christ mm. come in and intercede and do the work that he wants to do in your life. Yeah. And so we, we shortchange this all the time. And Christians are really good. They're, popular Christian writing is thriving. Mm. And sometimes when I read the new books out, yeah. they seem more uh, things of God or self-help than actually helping you engage Christ himself. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're written yeah. to an American market. Yeah. And especially, you know, in the book and in the time the letter was written, that church is pretty well to do, has some free time mm. in the Greek and Roman world, sort of like we do. We we live in a society that leisure is a thing that we can actually partake in because of technology, money, st- social economics. Yeah. And so when you get bored, you try to look to better yourself. Yeah to help yourself feel happy Mm -hmm. or fulfilled. And Christ and Paul, out of the 13 letters of the epistles, this one, um, he really wants us to center our lives on Christ to flourish. Yeah. And that's the point of the sermon series is really like, you want great relationships? I want great relationships. You want a great Mm -hmm. friendships? You want a great marriage? You want a great relationship with your kids? Do you want to successful life you know among people your co-workers yeah then you'll have to center your life on christ yeah that's great you know it's, it's like the idea I, I know this is this is coming from somewhere and uh but that if you want just friendship you can't have it right if you just want a good marriage you can't have it but if you want christ then it becomes possible and it's right. it's like you need the foundational thing there because what's going to happen is if you make your life all about community relationships at the expense of Christ, yep. you'll begin to idolize those things. Yep. And and when you idolize them, you put a demand and expectation on them that they'll never fulfill. Right. Like if you idolize um, a partner, if you idolize a spouse, well, you're going you're gonna to expect them to fulfill the longings that Christ can fulfill. But then ironically, it's once you are satisfied in Christ, you can enjoy the blessings. And so I think even there where it's like, we're pushing to say, hey, we need to be connected to Christ at the center. Mm-hmm. We need to be nourished and cherished and grown up in him and then let our relationships flourish from that. Because the fundamental relationship we have is with God, our creator. Right. And then flowing out of that comes the blessings that um, we experience in community. Yeah. In this conversation, Mark, I would love for us to get to how do we flourish with Christ. Yeah. I want to get there. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important and we've, we've already said it a little bit, but God, since the creation of the world, has wanted us to flourish mm-hmm. in a way in which so often we're not willing to accept. Mm-hmm. And that's sort of the Old Testament story that God would create a people, set apart a people, a family for his, his flourishment, right? Yeah. Set a covenant agreement between them, some laws between them. And then the Old Testament is about how they didn't, match up to them right yeah yeah and so like there's so many i mean if you read leviticus with eyes thinking it's god's flourishment for people you'll actually get through it in your bible reading plan yeah you know what i mean if you read it as like these are just a bunch of to-dos you're not going to get through it yeah but if you think god is setting a people apart for their flourishment Mm. and you know, the law is there. You said there's three major tiers to the law. Yeah. What are the three major tiers? Yeah, so sometimes it's what's called the three uses of the law. We have it's three different ways of thinking about the law. Okay. And this is really important because you can easily get stuck in one. Right. And so the first use of the law would be that it in general restrains sin in our world. So this is not talking about within a Christian context, but just in general. Like the law comes... And there's a general way in which it restrains sin. So do not murder. Yeah, it's truth that is yeah. right and wrong. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and this it's going to restrain certain evils. Right. Um, just in general. The second use of the law is that it reveals sin. And so <clears throat> when you read the law, 
you realize do not murder. And then Jesus is like, Hey, if you've, you're angry with your brother, you've committed murder in your heart, you know? Right. You're like, Oh man. You've like, already lived the Cain and Abel story. Yeah. Like you, this is you. Yeah. Like if you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. You realize as you look at the law, it's like this mirror that shines back in to you and you realize that you're unable to fulfill it on your own. Mm -hmm. And so that's the second use of the law. And that's the use that it's, I think for us as modern day Christians, depending on your context, I'd say modern day evangelical Christians might focus most on that one. Right. Which is absolutely a beautiful use of the law and is necessary. Yeah, totally. Because what happens is it reveals your need for Christ and you go to him because Christ is the one who fulfilled the law, who is your righteousness before God. Right. Who perfectly does it. But then the third use of the law is as a guide for Christians. And that's some of what we're talking about in this one is like actually that we need to understand as those who have been saved by God, the law is this tremendous blessing. Mm -hmm. And all along the law of God is, is actually a blessing. Now it's a, it's, you're cursed if you try and abide by everything written in the law as a means of your salvation. Right. Read Galatians. Um, yeah. But there's actually a, we need to understand that there's a tremendous beauty and blessing to the law. And it's God who is the creator designer who who is so loving who's showing us what life looks like and so even when you think about the new testament like we're, we're reading in colossians and as he's giving commands it's like we're seeing the law of god playing out and how does that look in our relationships now we know we won't fulfill it perfectly right um we will sin we need christ and his grace but there's actually a tremendous blessing mm -hmm. in following god's law and it's fundamentally a blessing for us as christians and so that's kind of what we're thinking some in this series is like how do we really use the th we're thinking about the third usage of the law yeah really we are yeah paul's talking about the third sort of usage of the law yeah. too yeah yeah how do we flourish and, and i think that's really important because it's not the new testament idea it's not like it was all bad bleak and dark and no. jesus showed up no it was like no there god has always been about redeeming saving and flourishing people yeah always I mean, think about this. I mean, is is it not the first command that we're given that God blessed them and said, "Be fruitful and multiply"? Right. It's like God blessed yeah. them and said, "It's so like, is it a blessing or a command?" Right. I think it's yes. Like, it's like He blessed them and then commanded, and that's Genesis one. And so, it's just even cool thing about that of like, this is a beautiful guide for our world and life. Right. And it's fundamentally a blessing. Yes. And don't think well, when we talk about these blessings and flourishing and use these words that that is absent of suffering. Yes. There's a reality yeah. that in the human experience that there will be troubles and suffering and hardships as is the human experience. However, you can flourish in the midst of hardship, suffering, tragedy, all those type of yeah. things in a deeper actually more robust way than you would ever imagine outside yeah. of it. And isn't that Psalm one? Right. Yeah. yeah. Blesses is the man. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you're, you're, you're rooted in such a way in God's law and his word that when the hard seasons come, you, you don't, you, you have your nourishment in life. Right. Totally. Totally. I love how Eugene Peterson in the message phrases it replanted in Eden. Mm. So he's giving you sort of the cosmological, imagery that yeah. you're like in Christ in God himself into his story you get replanted back where it all began wow and yeah. that's how you're supposed to live through life mm. with that reality that it, you're there even though in the midst of hardships yeah yeah, yeah. to use one more one more example I mean is, is yeah. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount oh man yeah it's what like a, the wind the winds and the storm come right right but those who are rooted in God's word and in Christ's teaching, they endure. Yeah, they build their lives upon a rock. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's it's not, like you're saying, it's not that there's no suffering. And, and I think that's where you get into what we'd call like the prosperity gospel. If right. you do the right things, God will bless you. It's like actually some of God's faithfulness to you will be seen in your suffering. Right. And that's where we have to have a view of Christ's life as the model for our lives. Yes, and that's what, Paul's doing in this epistle he's yeah. he's telling you the work of Christ the supremacy of Christ right mm -hmm. the depth of Christ um firstborn over all creation right these yeah. words preeminent yeah. like 
And then he's sort of grounding you in the reality of who Jesus is so that you can mimic that reality yeah. in some ways. Yeah. So, you know, we use this word, and this word is a very important word. I think sometimes we fail to un- appreciate the depth of it, but the gospel. Mm. You know, when, you, when you, you're asked, what is the gospel? Most people say it's, it's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to save me as a sinner, which is absolutely true. Yeah. But if you stop there, it's not the full depth of the gospel, right? Yeah. What is the depth of the gospel? Yeah, I think, I mean, a book title that you can read the book and it's worth it, but book title is by John Piper is God is the gospel. Mm. And I think that sums up so well. It's like, what is the greatest blessing and gift that we get as Christians? It's life with God himself. Right. And that's actually been formative for how I preach thinking every time I present scripture and the gospel, the highest thing I want to call people to is life with God himself. Right. And like, why are we saved from our sins? Because we have a loving and gracious God who draws us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And the spirit has applied that work to us. And so it's just like, what is the depth of it? It's like this life with God. Right. And then flowing from that is his life with his people life, you know, life as he's made it to be. Mm. So I, I, I love that. Just like the simplicity of God is the gospel. Yeah. He's the greatest gift. Mm. Yeah. And so often we, and I've had seasons where I've, I rather study the things of God mm. or the around God, but not God himself. Yeah. To understand, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's so convicting. I, I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just the reality. So we're in a relationship series, you know, Thomas said last week, we are created for relationships. Like, we're relational humans. Yeah. Every, no one lives in isolation. Mm-hmm. We all have relationships. Yeah. The problem in all relationship is me. Mm-hmm. That's why the work of Christ is so important, and the relationship with Christ is so important in a relationship. Yeah. Because he's transformative in what he's doing in me through my relationship. He actually doesn't transform my relationships as much as he transforms me through my relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. We're often, it's even like to your point of suffering, sometimes it's not that the suffering changes. I mean, that can happen. There can be a huge redemptive moment or things progressing, but often in the midst of suffering, it's not that the challenges go away, but our, our grasp of who Christ is and it changes. Right. That's so true. I, I I love that, Mark, that you're calling us into that. You know, like the the curriculum of my life, mm. right, is mm. in relationships. Yeah. And the curriculum in which God can transform me is in those relationships. Mm. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. So no matter if, like, your parents, your your kids, your your spouse— these are all fertile ground for Christ to actually do his work in you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's hard work at times mm-hmm. because Christ, I I love this about, this is the most, one of the most fascinating about, thing about Jesus for me is that he doesn't just say what we should do. He actually went to the full extent of what we should do. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he doesn't say those who are first shall be last and those who are last shall be first. He actually goes to the last nth degree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and through death. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to serve someone, are you willing to serve them to death? Mm. That's a great question. So I want, I want to throw a question back at you. Yeah. So when we think about this, cause you said, you know, we're thinking about that there's this deep personal formative work. Yeah. But what, what's also thinking like that relationships as this two way street, like how do you see that love as formative of other people through relationships. Yeah. Like how, do, how do, does the love of Christ through us form others? Like what, what insights would you have on that? Yeah. You know, in every relationship, there is a place where you receive and are given grace yeah. and love. Right. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing you, if you're, you've been a person who doesn't have great relationships, I would recommend a couple of things. One first, Get with a trained professional to talk through those relationships. Mm. Just have someone in the room to help you process 
what are the behaviors? What are the things you're seeking at in bad relationships? Mm. Like, what's the root cause of those bad relationships? Like, yeah. What are you identifying in those mm. to stay in them? The other thing is, Cloud and Townsend read it. I mean, this this book series is one of the. I wish every Christian, after two years of sort of discipleship, fundamental discipleship, has to read this book called Boundaries. Mm. And they talk. They have book series about having healthy boundaries mm. because relationships is not a, just about you giving yourself to people who are unworthy of giving you. Sometimes it is, mm-hmm. but it's also about you having proper restraint in order to give appropriate por- portions of yourself to people Yeah, to flourish. Yeah. And so I think cloud and Townsend two counselors are some of the best writers on mm. sort of understanding gospel and boundaries Mm. And they, they write a book, Boundaries, Boundaries with Kids. Those are all great books. I've never picked up one of them, and I thought, that was lame. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. I've always thought. You never regretted it. Yeah, I've never regretted it. They even have a great, for all those life group leaders who listen to the podcast, they even have the best life group book. Oh, really? About life groups, thriving life groups. Wow. And, um, yeah, I just really appreciate their tone because they understand the gospel really well. Mm-hmm. They also understand that... There's boundaries in relationships. There's yeah. boundaries in marriage. There's boundaries with our kids. There's boundaries with mm-hmm. our, our coworkers. You know that God doesn't call us to ignore either. Yeah. So there's a lot of discernment and wisdom. I think that's why you should read a Proverbs a day to keep the doctor away <laughs> in poor relationships. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but going back to your your real question, yeah, when you jump into a genuine re- relationship, especially with another believer, so. Your spouse is a believer. Hopefully that's your story. Um, your boss is a believer. Hopefully that's your story, right? Mm-hmm. Hopefully your kids are believers. Yeah. Hopefully that's your story. That's where the gospel can really be dis- demonstrated back to you and your helplessness and your weakness and your foibles and your your failings where you repent, you say sorry, you confess sins. And the generosity of that relationship actually deepens your love for Christ. Um, and that's not every case for every relationship. Yeah. We know that. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm talking about ideals here. Yeah, um, And that's why I think Paul calls us to be yoked with other believers mm-hmm. because he knows that's fertile ground for the gospel to flourish. Yeah. Because it's two-way street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there's also the witness for those who don't yet know the gospel. Right. Oh, man, yeah. you hit the nail on the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Could, where they see where they see the love, and and I think like what is our goal as Christians in the pastoral ministry class? I was in last week. I was just reflecting on more and more. My goal as a pastor is not to solve people's problems, and this is this is a total Jism. So you'll love it, but it's like to put them in an encounter with Jesus. Yep. Like we can't solve each other's problems. No. We can. People can see Christ in us, but ultimately our hope is to put people in encounters with Jesus, and that. That's an opportunity for unbelieving friends, family members, coworkers, commu- people in the community. And that's a witness we have. And so that's one of the hopes we have for this series is as we are living out this, you go into Colossians 4, and there's also talk about how do we now make Christ known um, outside of this. Uh, I think it's Colossians 4, verses 3. It says, At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of a Christ on which I am, a, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Yep. And we were talking about that in the preaching meeting this week. That this is cool because Colossians four now is is giving a, a witness right of how the Christian lives to an unbelieving world. Oh, man. Yeah, I think this is one of those realms of relationships that's always been in the Bible. God's had a part of people for the nations. Yeah. For mission. Yeah. He's setting apart us and all our relationships for mission. Yeah. It's to display his goodness, his kindness, his character, all the things that flourish in our lives to woo people, to persuade people, to draw people into that story with him as well. Yeah, amen. Yeah, it's a really good. I know we didn't talk about actually what you preached on this week. <laughs> I think you think we talked 
in great detail, a little deeper detail on just the genuineness of Christ in relationships through this podcast. Yeah. I'm encouraged. Yeah. I really am. And I hope that, you know, Mark, as you think about like very practically, how does someone today, they're like, okay, you keep saying center your life on Jesus, center your life on Jesus. How does that, how does a person at Calvary do that today after they hit stop on this podcast? Yeah. I'll give, I'll give you, I'll give three ideas that go together. Okay. One is one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten is preach the gospel to yourself every day. Okay. I got this through Jerry Bridges, who's an author, Dr. Jerry Bridges, who passed away, who's a close family friend. And he uh, got it from someone else, I believe. But just the idea of you can approach God today because of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Romans 5, 8 says God shows his love for us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So maybe you're just in, the, in it today and, and you're reflecting on your own sin, your own challenges, your own difficulties. And so just the idea of being with Christ today seems so far off. But know that on your worst day, Christ loves you. Right. Like God shows his love in your sin. And so why can you approach him today? Because of the gospel. And then, then I think it's two and three, his word and prayer. Like yeah. he's given you his word. So approaching him in the gospel to open his word and reflect and pray on it. Yep. You know, it's simple, but but it's the beauty of the Christian life that God has actually given this incredible blessing of his word right. for us. And something that I so easily take for granted. Right. But like God has spoken to us mm-hmm. and we have that. Yeah. I would add one fourth thing. Go for it. Create enough silence to do all those things today. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a challenge. That is in our modern world, that is the one of the hardest challenges. Yeah. Much needed though. Much needed. Yeah. Thanks so much, Calvary, for listening today. I hope you've been blessed. Like always, if you need someone to pray for you, you need to reach out to one of the pastors on staff. Always go to CalvaryBible.com. Let us know what's going on in your life. We love you. We're praying for you. We're praying for your relationships. Here at Calvary, we are focused on having the healthiest relationships possible in this world. And we only know that that's through Jesus Christ Mm -hmm. and his life within us. So let's all today take some time to look at, to be with, to actively obey Jesus Christ. Thanks, Mark, for being here. Yep, thanks for having me.